Well, today we're going to talk about are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to pay the price? Recently, I encountered a situation where a person offended me. And when I say recently, I mean this happened Monday night. Monday night, someone came into my property, into my gate in my home, and vandalized my truck. You see, I live in our community here in Ward 7. I have a big gate in the front of my home, and I park my truck in my driveway. And so I have this gate with these double doors that swing open, right? And, you know, it, it's kind of a hassle to lock the double door gate because, you know, I got to, like, get the key, unlock the gate. It's one of them hook locks where you got to, like, swing the gate a certain way so the hook latch to go out, push the gate open, hop in the truck, pull out, uh, park, get back out, lock the gate, get back in the truck, go off. It takes me, like, three minutes to leave my yard, okay? So if I need to get somewhere quickly, it's kind of a nuisance. So for the longest, I've just been kind of pulling my gate to where it's, it's not locked in. It's just kind of like a crack, right? Just a little opening. And, you know, on top of that, you know, sometimes I can count on one hand how many times I've forgotten to close the back hatch of my truck. There's been times where I was carrying groceries and, you know, I, I accidentally left the back hatch of my truck open. And so I'll come out the next morning and say, oh, the back of my truck was open all night. And praise God, you know, you know, nobody went in there. Everything's cool. Well, Monday night. I brought the boys home from Kung Fu class. They got their white belts recently. So now they have a, you know, okay. I, I'm still dad, but, you know, they got white belts. So I brought them home from Kung Fu class. I had all that Kung Fu stuff in my hands, and I didn't leave the back hatch open this time, but I forgot to lock the doors. I came out Tuesday morning to take my sons to school, and normally when I leave the house, I'll, I'll lock the home door, and I'll hit the unlock button twice so my sons can beat me to the truck in the yard. Well, they tried to get into the truck, but they couldn't because the driver's seat was leaning all the way back. Now, I like to relax in my truck, but I said, you know, I didn't lean my truck back, my seat back in my truck that far. And so my sons couldn't get into the truck because the front seat was leaned all the way back. And I, I said, well, wait a minute, what happened? So I go to the truck, I open the driver's side door, and it's wet on the inside of my truck. Now, it had rained a lot, you know, the night before, Monday night. So I said, do I have a leak in my truck? But then I noticed that the liquid sitting in my cup holder and in my console and on my dashboard and on my windshield and on the roof of the interior of my truck and the liquid on the window of the passenger seat and the liquid all in the front row was yellow. I said, oh, someone urinated in my truck. Somebody peed in my truck. Then, then I saw all the stuff in my glove box on my passenger seat was urine all over it. I said, man, somebody was peed off that they couldn't steal something from me, so they peed in my truck. I said, dang, man, that's, that's cold. I mean, I tried to put two and two together. I said, you know, it was raining really hard. It, it may have been a homeless person who was looking for some shelter and saw an opportunity saw my gate ajar, and just happened to try to check my door, and he was successful. I gave him an opportunity to get into my vehicle, and he probably fell asleep in my truck. He probably needed a place to sleep, and so he leaned back. He may have been homeless. I don't know, but I smelled alcohol in the urine, so I said it may have been a homeless person who was drunk, and when they woke up, they probably said, man, let me see if this dude got some stuff in his truck, and he went through my stuff, and there was nothing in there, so maybe in anger, he urinated all over the front row of the inside of my truck. So the first thing I, I, the first emotion I felt was disrespect. I mean, it's one thing for you to go into my vehicle and, and try to get some stuff, man. You know, a, a lot of crimes in my community are economic crimes. It's out of necessity, people who are in poverty. I've seen a young man once before, uh, I saw these two teenagers uh, riding on my street um, on bicycles, circling the street. And I said, what y'all up to? It was midnight. I just happened to be up, and I looked out my window, and I saw these dudes riding, circling. And he went to 
a, a, a truck parked across the street from my house, riding, 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 stop, pull on the handle, ride, 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 looking for an opportunity. And then he came up to my wife's car, and I looked out the window. He rolled, 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 went to my wife's car, pulled the handle, and rolled, 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 looking for an opportunity. I said, you know, if, if, if it's a crime of uh, economic proportions, I, I, I can get with that, man. If, if, if I'm simple enough or neglectful enough to leave my door open, then, you know, you in there, you got your stuff, you try to take something from me, you, you got out of there with my stuff. But to urinate in my truck, someone peed in my truck. I felt disrespected. And I started getting upset. And I said to myself, you know what, man? I got my sons out of there. I have uh, another car. I took them to school. And, and, and I had to change my whole week around. I, I went through a three-day process of sanitizing the inside of my truck to get the smell of urine out and to make sure that all the toxins and all the nastiness was out of the truck. It cost me a couple hundred dollars, too. So then I was really angry when I had to pay that money. <laughs> I'm in Home Depot buying... Uh, urine odor remover stuff. I went to this professional that got an A-plus on Angie's List in Capitol Heights. He steam cleaned it. He put the urine chemical on it. I smelled it. Nah, bro, it's still there, man. Hit it again. Hit it again. Hit it again. He steamed it. He put the water, hot water. He's like, sir, I did what I could. Nah, bro. It. You want to smell it? No, sir. We'll, we'll spray it again. He sprayed it, sprayed it, sprayed it, sprayed it again. He was a nice guy, too, man. A brother from Ethiopia. Man, nice dude. We were talking about all kind of stuff. Talked about faith and everything else. And, and so I, I'm desanitizing my truck. I'm changing my whole schedule around, and I'm getting ready for this meeting at the White House on Friday. So my truck got peed in on Monday night. I spent Tuesday and good part of Wednesday cleaning the truck, and I'm, I got to prepare for this meeting at the White House to sit in a room with President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence and only 99 other people. I was one of 100 people in the room with the President and the Vice President. And I was in there talking about godly reform in our penal system. And I said to my wife, this is a smoke screen that the devil has put into my life to keep me distracted from focusing what I'm supposed to focus on to help our country. As a pastor, I'm not a politician, I'm a pastor. I said to myself, I'm really upset with this dude that peed in my truck. But it wasn't until today that I began to have compassion on him. I began to have compassion on the homeless person who slept in my truck and peed in my truck. And I began to pray earnestly that God would save his soul. I began to pray that whatever demonic influence he's dealing with would be removed from his body, that he would find work, that Christ would find him lost in his sin, that he would confess his sin and repent. I prayed for his family. I prayed for the ties that he's cut and broken. And I prayed that Satan's stronghold on his life would be destroyed. And that brings us to our main point today. And our main point for today is this. Grace is love that pays a price. And I must show that to people who don't treat me right. I said, grace is a love that pays a price, and I must show that to people who don't treat me right. I know that I'm not the only person in this room who has been mistreated by somebody. And isn't it just like our God to challenge us in the scriptures to go above and beyond ourselves to love on people who have harmed us, taken money from us, vandalized from us, physically assaulted us, said negative things about us. I sat in a room with the uh, Trump administration on Friday, and Van Jones was there as well. If you don't know Van Jones, he's an African-American Democrat. He's on CNN. He's got some other things. He and I talked a little bit, and we talked about reform. I said, hey, Van, I, I'm a fan of what you do. I said, I'm a pastor and a rapper. He said, what? I said, yeah, man, I'm here in the city, and I, I'm, I'm trying to do work. And so we exchanged information, and I'm working with people in our country to help see social justice happen in a biblical way. There's some things I don't agree with with the Trump administration. I'm not going to go into the details, but I agree with what they're trying to do with this bill. They are trying to help end mass incarceration, which impacted the man that peed in my truck. 
I was cleaning out the truck saying, man, this dude going to pee in my truck. I'm about to go to Capitol Hill to try to help him and other people probably in our community just like him. But that's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to get upset and focus on the symptom rather than the system. Don't miss that. Don't miss it. The symptoms of sin are what you want to try to treat. And the devil wants you to focus on treating symptoms rather than changing systems. We're going somewhere. See, you may not have this big plight like I do for social justice, biblical social justice in our country and in our world. But let me share this with you, ladies and gentlemen. I am a firm believer. I am a firm believer that God in all of his sovereignty has positioned you and I to be around people who are difficult to love, people who mistreat us, people who say negative things about us, people who harm us, people who offend us. Why? So that we can show this love that pays a price. Jesus said, this is how the world will know that you're my disciples, by how you love each other. Not by how big your church is. Not by how fancy you dress. Not by how eloquently you pray. Can you show love to people who have harmed you? That's why I'm careful what I post about my dealings on Capitol Hill. Because a lot of people might say, oh, Devin, Devin's down with Trump, but Devin's down with this. I'm down with Jesus. I don't care who's in the White House. I serve the God on the throne. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I'm an independent when it comes to politics in this country. I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm a theocrat. Theo meaning God. I am of God. I'm an advocate of the theocratic rule, but I live in a democracy. But earth is not my home. Heaven is my home. I'm an alien to this planet. I represent the king of kings. And I will work with anybody who is going to, I don't know what their motives are, but I will work with anybody who wants to help bring biblical change in our world. Now, I can disagree with people on Capitol Hill about other stuff they want to push, other bills they want to pass, all that. But on this issue with helping to end mass incarceration, I'm cool with it. Now, you may have a problem with that. And that's okay. I challenge you to go deeper today with us as we dig into the scriptures to talk about loving people through difficulty. I can, I can disagree with all kinds of things about your life. I don't care if you're the president, my auntie, my cousin, my neighbor, or a homeless person that pees in your truck, like me. I can disagree with a whole bunch of stuff about your life, but I can still love and respect you. That's five, uh uh-huh. That's six. Too too late. (laughs) Our main point for the day before we get into the scriptures is this. Grace is love that pays a what? Price. And I must show that to people who don't treat me what? Isn't it hard to love people who get on your nerves? Oh, I got to testify, okay. Isn't it hard to love on people that just, uh, see, a lot of us, see, you're not, even, you're not even having to deal with politicians and people down on Capitol Hill like the Lord has positioned me. And by the way, let me say this parenthetically, meaning let me put this in the parentheses. I didn't even ask for this. I'm from Farsville, Maryland. I live in Northeast D.C., I answered the call of God to be a pastor. God has positioned me to influence the people that influence the world. And just like the prophets of the Old Testament, I will go before the kings, and I will praise what they do that is godly, and I will rebuke what they do that is ungodly. Let's keep going. It's summertime. You about to have some cookout. People going to be blasting music loud in front of your house. People going to be stunting at the red light, looking at you. Ladies, dudes going to be saying nasty comments about you and your outfit. It's getting turned up. It's about to get hot. And this is what happens. Our flesh starts to get boiled, and people can start saying things that offend us and doing things that bother us. Anybody got some uncles or cousins that just don't talk? Only me? I know it ain't just a turner. Okay, a few more of us. Does anybody have any people in your neighborhood that just can't get over beef with each other? There's always some conflict. Anybody? Oh, y'all must live in a nice neighborhood. Okay. You're welcome to come over and hang out with me for a little bit. Let's look in the Bible. In Philemon, Philemon has no chapters. It's the short book of the Bible, but it's got a lot to say. Philemon, we're going to look at verse 4. Philemon, the apostle Paul is writing to Philemon. 
and he's going to unpack for us this concept of grace paying a price. Y'all still with me? Let's keep going. Paul says this, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. And I am praying that you will put into action, put into what? Put into action the generosity that comes from your faith. See, a lot of us don't have a problem saying we have faith in God. A lot of us have a problem putting that faith into action. How many of us know people that call themselves Christians, but you can't tell by their actions? Y'all might be thinking about me. I'm trying. I'm trying. (laughs) Actions speak louder than what, y'all? All All right, let's go to verse 6. I'm sorry, we read a little bit of 6. Let's keep going. As you understand and experience all the good things we have in Christ. Look at 7. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed the hearts of God's people. So Paul is opening up this, this letter by saying, yo, Philemon, man, you doing it, bro. You got the love of God in your heart. You backing it up with actions. You ain't just talking about it. You being about it. That's the type of followers of Christ we need in this world. But let's keep going. Verse 8. That is why I am boldly asking of you a favor. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing for you to do, but I'm going to ask you to see what your character is like. Isn't that like God to give us a choice? Paul gives his brother in Christ a choice to do the right thing. Let's see what it is. Verse 9, but because of our love, I prefer simply to ask you, consider this as a request for me, Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus. At this point in Paul's life, he's old in his age. He is in prison. He's in prison for preaching the gospel. He's in prison for doing what we're going to do this Saturday at Benning Road Metro Station. We're going to be giving out 600 bottles of water to people on the corner, praying with them, talking to them about God, inviting them to come out to our church cookout, our community cookout coming up June 3rd. Can we hear some noise for the community cookout? Okay, yeah, okay. That's what I'm talking about. Let's keep going. So Paul is locked up for what we're about to do this Saturday, talking about Jesus in ancient Rome. Let's get back to the scriptures. So he's an old man locked up, and verse 10 says, I appeal to you, Philemon, to show kindness to my child, Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Mm. Let me tell you about Onesimus. Onesimus was one of 600,000 slaves in ancient Rome. In ancient Rome, there were about 600,000 slaves, people who were in slavery. Now, it wasn't as cruel as the slavery that Africans experience here in America, but slaves were expensive, and they were servants that could buy their freedom if they could raise the funds. But how can you do a fundraiser if you're a slave? So this guy named Onesimus, who was not a Christian, who was not a follower of Christ, he was sold as a slave to a Christian, and guess what that Christian's name was who was a slave master? Philemon. Yeah. He was a Christian with a slave. A lot of Christians had slaves. Even in this country, so-called Christians owned people. How can you call yourself a follower of Christ and also say that you own another human being? Say lie. Let's keep going. So Onesimus was a runaway slave who stole something from Philemon on his way out. Oh, you gonna you gonna lock me? You going oh, I'm a slave. Give me that phone, cuz I'm gone. And so he stole Philemon's stuff. The Bible doesn't go into detail. I'm sure it wasn't a phone. But he stole something from his master Philemon, and he ran away and got caught in another city, and he ended up right in the jail cell with Paul. And while, while Onesimus is in jail, Paul shares the gospel with him and converts him to the faith. And now Paul is making this appeal to Philemon to say, show that grace to the person you used to own who did you wrong. Because you did God wrong. And God's love paid a price. What's our main point? Let's look at it. Let's get it on the screen. Grace is love that pays a what? It's going to cost you something to be a, it's going to cost you something to love people who get on your nerves. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you your patience. It's going to cost you your your conversations. It's going to cost you your emotions. It's going to cost you some nights praying. 
first, the first night I saw, the, the first night after I realized a dude peed in my truck, I wasn't thinking about praying for him. I was about, to, let me find him. Let me tell you where the bathroom is. You know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> can I just keep it 100? Okay, he peed in my truck. I said, okay, yeah, okay. You know, you could have peed on the grass. You pee. what? <sighs> so, but after some time, I began to have compassion on this broken person. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, Philemon, you call yourself a Christian. Where's your compassion for this person who did you wrong? Let's go back to the Bible. If you're with me, saying with you. Let's get back at it. Paul says in verse 10, let's look at verse 10. I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith. That just means I shared the gospel with him and he received salvation after I talked to him about Jesus. I became his father in the faith while he was in prison. Look at 11. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past when he was a rebellious slave stealing from you and running away. But now he is very useful to both of us. Watch this. I am sending him back to you because he's getting out of jail today. I'm sending him back to you and with him comes my own heart. Under the Roman law, Philemon has every right to execute Onesimus. Roman law said that if a slave ran away, they could be executed by their master. But now Philemon has a dilemma. Do I submit to the government rule on earth or do I submit to the theocratic rule in heaven? Do I exercise my right according to the laws of the land to kill another human being to set an example for all my other slaves, or should I just wrestle with the fact that I shouldn't be owning people anyway? <laughs> you know what baffles me? Because Paul is addressing politics a little bit here. Because Onesimus has a right as a citizen of Rome to act person and to own slaves. But Paul is challenging him with the idea of, why do you even own people in the first place? Wouldn't it be more loving to hire people? But you want to own somebody. That's what our prison system is doing in this country. But that's a whole other sermon. Look at verse 12. I'll read it again. Paul says, I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. Look at 13. I wanted to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. In other words, they were about to start a prison ministry. You know, Paul, like, man, I'm in here, I'm in here for life, bro. So, you know, uh, you in here for a few months, let's share the gospel together. You know what I'm saying? And so Paul's like, I'm in here doing prison ministry with Onesimus, and I could keep him here, and he could help me do ministry in here, sharing the gospel with other dudes that's locked up. But watch this. Look what he says. Verse 14. But I didn't want to do anything without your what? Because mm. <laughs> remember, by law, Philemon still owns him, right? Yeah. Philemon still owned Onesimus, but he wants to give Philemon an opportunity to do the right. That's just like God, isn't it? God knows, what, knows that you know what you should do, right? You need to forgive your father. You need to forgive your brother. You need to forgive your mother. But instead of doing that, you hold on to this bitterness and anger, yet you want God to forgive you. Our main point for today is this. Grace is love that pays a what? And I must show that the people who don't treat me what? Look at this verse again. Look at verse... <laughs> Look at verse 14. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were what? Don't you hate working with people that's been forced to work with you? Girl, I can't stand this job. I can't wait till I get off. Shoot. They're horrible coworkers. You hate when you get them at your register. You in a rush, they lackadaisically ringing you up, talking to people. You know, child, I tell you, you know, you know these, these people around here today, and you're like, uh, ma'am. He said, I don't want you to feel forced. I want you to do it willingly. Let's keep going. Verse 15, it seems you lost Onesimus for a little while so that you could have him back forever. I love that verse. 
he offended you and stole from you, you have every right to bow, execute him under the Roman law. You lost him as a runaway slave who stole your stuff. Now you can have him back forever as a brother in Christ. I hope that the homeless man who peed in my truck Monday night will give me an opportunity to have him back forever as a brother in Christ. If him peeing in my truck is what it took for Devin Turner to pray for his soul, the $200 or so I had to pay to clean that truck was worth it. That's one of the best outreaches I could do in this city. Send a sinner to my property to vandalize my truck, oh God, that I might pray for him, that you might save his soul and he share the gospel around this country. That's a good $200 to spend. I could have been offended, but I looked at it as an opportunity. <laughs> Y'all still with me? Look at 16. Paul says this to Philemon. Look what he says. Verse 16. He is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave. For he is a beloved what? Especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Look at 17. <laughs> this is good. Let me stop. I can't go any further. Let me slow down. To some of us, that woman in our mind doesn't even have a name that's offended us. Her name is B. B-I-T. I won't finish it. That's what you call her. We ain't on speaking terms. I ain't got nothing to say to her. No, 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 no. I ain't got nothing to say to her, Pastor. No, no, Pastor. I ain't got nothing to say to her. What I'm telling you is this. You can get that person back, and you can have a relationship that means so much more than whatever the offense was. Is anything... See, this... Whenever I go to a funeral, a lot of times the people that are screaming or hollering the loudest and throwing themselves in the casket are people who had some unreconciled issue, right? And your pettiness stacked up all that hate, all that animosity, all that bitterness and offense for so many years, you don't even remember what you beefing about. And you call yourself a Christian. How many Philemons are in here? You are holding people hostage that you need to let go so that you can embrace them as a brother or sister in Christ Jesus. They can't be a slave that owes you and your brother or sister in Christ. You have to choose. You going to be that N-word that owe me for the rest of my life or am I going to forgive you and say God loves you? Can y'all handle this today? Keep going. We almost done. I know this is a tough teaching. Look at this again. Look at verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, Philemon, welcome him as you would welcome me. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? I love this. I love this passage. Let's keep going. Look at 18. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to me. That's what Jesus did for you on the cross. See, you owed a debt that you couldn't pay. You sinned and you deserved to pay the ultimate price, which was death in hell. But Jesus stepped in and said, God the Father, whatever she owes, whatever he owes, charge it to me. I will die for them so they can live for you. The great preacher Martin Luther said, we all are Onesimuses. We all have offended the master. We all owe a debt we cannot pay. We all have been slaves to sin. But praise God that Jesus Christ bought our freedom. Yeah. 
Christ could forgive you, why can't you forgive them? Y'all still here? Verse 19. Paul says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. <laughs> that was slick, man. <laughs> Paul's like, look here, man. I shared the gospel to you and you got saved. I shared the gospel to him and he got saved. You need to forgive him. Because uh, I did a lot for you. But even more so, God did more for both of you. Yes, my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask. And even more. Let's look at, uh, look at some stuff on the screen. Our next slide is going to say what Onesimus' name means. Look at that. The name Onesimus means profitable or useful. It's kind of a play on words. <laughs> and the name Philemon means affectionate. One who is kind, one who kisses. <laughs> Onesimus was profitable and useful as a slave, but the question is, is Philemon going to show that kindness and forgive? And that's the tension you and I are in. The Bible doesn't go into much detail as what happens next. I think that's on purpose because we all are Philemons too. You have people that you need to forgive, and God is giving you the opportunity to do the right what? Thing. Our main point. <laughs> Grace is love that pays of what? Right. And I must show that to people who don't treat me. Right. Let's look at the definition of impute. To impute means to put it on account. Anybody remember what layaway is? Okay. It, okay, if you ever use layaway, I'll still use layaway. Put your hand high. Let me see who's in here. Okay, about half of us. You still use it? Okay, pray, yeah. Let me tell you what that, let, for those, half of, half of y'all don't know what layaway is. Let me explain to you what that is. Layaway is when you don't have enough money to pay for something, but you, you do a payment plan with the company, right, or the store, and you paying it up until you have paid enough to finally purchase it. It's different than credit. See, if you do credit, yeah, you can swipe the card and you can get it today and you just owe it the interest. Layaway is you can't get it till it's paid in full. <laughs> Y'all know where I'm going? The doctrine of imputation is when Jesus Christ died on the cross, our sins were put on his account, good God. He was treated the way we should have been treated. When we trusted him as Savior, his righteousness is put on whose account? And now God accepts us in, come on, that's the best layaway plan I ever seen in my life. <laughs> ah, God is good, man. You on a divine layaway plan. <laughs> Christ paid that account. He paid it up. And he paid it in full even before you committed the sins that you're going to commit. Good. Woo! See, 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 that, see, see, that, see, see that, that's, that's, that's another level. See, let, let me explain why that's another level. Let me explain it's another level because, see, when you take out a line of credit, this is a little finance course for you. When you take out a line of credit, you only get approved for a certain amount, right? Based on your credit, right? With the layaway plan, it's unlimited because you might want something else that you can't pay for. <laughs> and when you come in here, my mom and I used to go to Kmart, we used to go to Ames. Y'all remember Ames? Who remember Ames? <laughs> Came out, right? Okay, Ames. Used to go on Ames. I'd be like, Mom, can I get those shoes? Uh, you can eventually, but not today. And then 
I come back in another day and I say, oh, mom, uh, uh, can I get that shirt? Now, Devin, you just asked for the shoes. But uh, we can get that shirt. You won't get it for three months from now, but hope you can still fit it. But we'll put it on <laughs> layaway. This is what Jesus did for you and me. At the time you got saved, let's say you were 16 when you got saved. Jesus Christ didn't just die on the cross and forgive you for the sins that you committed up until when you received salvation. Good God. He paid that account in full. He paid that sin account in full. That means he paid up into whatever else you're going to owe in the future. Good God. He has enough in the bank account to cover you for eternity. Woo! I feel like flipping off here, but I, I would hurt myself. And Gene would be mad. Gene going to catch him? He looking like a oh, pastor. Don't. <laughs> can't help but get excited about the law of imputation. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I... You may say, Pastor Devin, how can I apply this message to my life? How can I take this one step further in my spiritual journey? Here's our takeaway for this afternoon. Identify someone in your life who doesn't treat you right. Hmm? Ask God to help you show them grace this week. Let's stand to our feet and pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we just come before you right now to say that we realize that this takeaway is easier said than done. Lord, we ask that you would put in our minds right now that person that we need to forgive, that person who has offended us, that person, oh God, who we don't want to extend grace to. And we pray, oh God, that you would speak to our hearts and minds right now and soften our hearts, oh God. Help us, oh Lord, not to be pushovers and not to continue to let people harm us in a way that is unwise. But in the same breath, help us to exercise wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.